Jason, thank you so much. It's so nice to see you. Thank you for having me. I met you just very recently at the fabulous uh, Telling Untold Histories Unconference, and I was attended your workshop on narrative dialogue and was smitten with your approach. And you have this fascinating background in history and uh, working with religious institutions and historical institutions and doing public engagement um, and listening to people connect the past and the present and the future. And so I was really excited that you were willing to chat with me today. When I approached you to do this and I, I outlined this, what were you thinking? Um, wow, what was I thinking? I was thinking storytelling. Um, I love stories. And one of the things I think we, we talked about and you were very interested in was that I, um, I said, I really love people's stories. That, that to me is um, what I love. I'm almost like a story vampire. Um, that I love to hear people talk about things and things that interest them and things that make them exciting and things that make them happy and things that make them sad and, and things that are important to them and things that are even trivial to them. Um, I love people when they're in storytelling mode. I find that that's when um, people are at their best. Do you, have you honed an ability to ask for stories then because you want, you're hungry for them from people? I don't really ask so much. Um, I will sometimes. I will say to someone, um, how did you get here? I, I don't mean how they drove there or how they caught the public transportation. Um, but usually it's just talking and it's very subtle. And um, I don't want it, and them to even think that I'm asking for their story. I just want them to feel natural and that they want to tell me something. They have something to say and, and that there's someone that will listen to them. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about your listening skills and how you've been listening to communities uh, throughout New Jersey and, and I guess the greater Philadelphia area as well to make the past meaningful to them to understand what, why they would be interested. Sure. Um, I think the way, one of the very interesting things, I, abilities I have is the ability to kind of almost be in slow motion while the rest of the world is kind of working at regular motion. Um, I remember that when I played football, they kind of, they used to call it the zone, right? This idea that, that things are kind of happening and you're kind of, okay, this thing's going to roll out and this is how things are going to be and I can do this and do that and be there when I need to be there. So with conversations, I find it very similarly that I'm, um, often I'm ahead of myself so I know what I'm going to say before I'm going to say it. And so that also works when I hear things, um, when I hear stories, when I hear points of interest, things that snag my interest. I make light of them, I make note of them, and I want to come back to them, or I say well, at that moment, I want to kind of continue to dig a little deeper. Um, and I look for some type of narrative sense um, for the person that's telling the story. So I think for me, listening is, is very much active, knowing uh, what I'm interested in, but also what the other person that's telling the story is interested in, and trying a way to kind of uh, weave those things together. I think it's all about stories, and it's all about weaving things together, whether it's someone weaving um, their own story together, or two people weaving themselves together in storytelling and listening mode. Can you tell me about a time uh, that you saw people weave their stories together well? Oh, sure. Uh, this one in Bridgeton, South Jersey, where I'm working with a, a group of Mexican uh, American kids and they're doing folk dance. So as I begin to kind of figure out what they're doing, their folk dance isn't from either of the, the states in Mexico they're from, these kids are from. Um, and the, the dress is completely from another place. And the dance moves are different. And, and the whole thing's different. And, I, and, and the syncopation is different. And I, and I say, well, what's going on here? And these kids weave together the story of, it was part of their exposure to hip hop music. Um, it was partly their exposure to each other. So it didn't have to have be based on a location. It was the fact that they just liked the costumes from this part of Mexico. So they wanted to use them. And so it began to make me think about authenticity and, and, and that, well, I don't really like that word, but I realized that they were authentic to kids growing up in South Jersey who were Mexican-American in 2016. And that's what they were doing. And that was amazing, weaving together all these different storylines. Um, to me, what I saw was them creating a new American identity. Through the weaving together of these, these storylines, and their grandparents would look at them and their parents said, What are you doing? These things are mismatched. And it, they weren't mismatched for them. 
because they were asking different questions. Um, and so because they were asking different questions, they got a different answer. So they looked different and they danced different. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, and that, that to me is what I took away from that conference is this idea that there's, there are always stories emerging and that we have to um, keep the tapestry somewhat loose so that new things can be knitted onto it. New things can be um, a patch means that there's a rip um, and, and maybe there, there's certainly a hole if somebody's yes. story needs to be added. Yes. It's, it's a quilt, absolutely. It, it's, um, that's, that's what it is. And, and it's always, you, it's a quilt without edges, right? And so you don't want to find the edges. You don't want edges. You just want to keep, keep sewing and patching together. Um, you know, and ideally you'd have uh, 7.5 billion uh, patches, but uh, we can't have that many. But you just keep, you know, keep connecting and how these stories connect and, and how do they disconnect? Because sometimes the beauty is, is when they don't connect, right? And that they're different. Um, that's how we get changed. Right, um, and that's why I think maybe that's why I love stories because they're different experiences than mine. And so I feel like those things help me grow, um, and hopefully my stories will help other people grow. And um, so I think that's why storytelling is so near and dear to me that it's it's a way of growth. And um, I'm a very you know, I like to talk. I'm a very loquacious person. So um, I think that's the way I grow is through conversation and, uh, and through stories and storytelling. Are you reflective on the growth of your own story? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think that's, that's where it begins. It begins in kind of looking at yourself and understanding where you are and why you're there and, and the choices that you've made. And I've always felt that I wanted to live a life where I never look back and regret um, that I grew from every situation, um, no matter what it was, whether it's a setback or, or something that pushes you forward. Um, so I think I'm always reflecting on, on my story um, but I think that the thing I, I don't always do is reflect upon how my story is like someone else's story necessarily. I, I don't, um, I try not to make my story the story or the most, the, the story that is the barometer for other stories. Um, I found that that's problematic when you think, oh, my way is the way, um, that there, there are many, many ways. And so I think what that does for me is it gives me um, hope that there's opportunity um, that there's always something out there. You, if you're not finding it, it's because you haven't looked there. So um, that's why I'm always looking for new stories. I'm always looking there. Um, I don't. Um, I don't necessarily think of my own as a as a story per se. I think of mine as events and packets, <laughs> quanta, <laughs> right? Little packets of things. And so I, I really kind of look at my life as a packets of things and how these packets happen and and what may have caused them to, to happen, and more importantly, what does that mean for, for the present going forward? Really interesting. Um, you're, you're making me realize that people often talk about using story as a search for commonalities. We have to find commonalities, and if we find our commonalities, then we're going to get along swell. And like you, I'm not even that interested in commonalities i just want to hear the story i well, just yeah i mentioned commonalities to, to 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 bind people who aren't connected right i i definitely that that i i, I do like commonalities but that i agree with you is not the most interesting thing um the most interesting thing are are the differences right you know the the grand canyon wouldn't be interesting if there wasn't a giant cleave cut in the earth right and, and so the separation um, the difference in, in, in elevation, right, in climate. So yeah, I'm with you. I think the, the differences are, are where it's at. Do you have an example of that? Of a time that you've, besides the Grand Canyon, uh, a time in human relations where you've seen a disconnect become really interesting or where those patches don't align on, on a quilt where the difference are is a really interesting moment. Um, so yeah, an interesting one comes to mind. I wonder how this is going to play out because I haven't, I haven't thought this through, but it comes to mind. Um, I was at a uh, conference with uh, someone uh, I, I respect very much, a uh, scholar, and uh, coming back from a conference, uh, he said to me, we we're talking about black and white issues and he was white, and he said, um, oh, well, you, you, you've made it, you've won. And I said, I, I don't understand what you mean. He said, well, you know, you 
gone to college, you know, you're middle class, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and I said that, I don't, I don't think I've won. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't look at it that way. And he said, well, we're, we're going to have to disagree on that. And, and, and that was, um, that was, uh, that was really an interesting conversation. And it, it made me think a, a lot um, about what would make him say that. But I think it made me think a lot really about myself and what does success mean? Um, because his definition of success was not my definition of success. Um, because um, the stories, scholars can sometimes, or sometimes blunt the, the actual stories of lived experience and lived life. Um, that is a, um, something I think I find sometimes in scholars. Um, and so it made me kind of look at it that way in the sense to understand really what that meant and what he meant by that and, and, and what I mean by that. Um, and so I realized, given that, that our, our, our levels of success mean different things, but also that he, did, he didn't understand a lived experience. And, and that's happened um, you know, multiple times um, to, to, to me and I'm sure other people um, of difference of color, of sexual gender or persuasion, right? Um, that you have these kind of moments that are just kind of disconnected and you're like, well, no, I, you know, I, I haven't and I, I don't understand that. And, and the other person won't listen to you because they made up their mind that you have succeeded. Um, and that's, uh, that's troubling. So I think that the thing for me came out of that was personal growth, that the other person was, was not going to have that personal growth. They were um, solidified in their position. Um, and I felt that, that in continuing that conversation would just end up being an argument. Um, but it, it was a point for me to understand and to learn about um, myself and, and what success meant, but also to understand what other people think it means um, and don't really know what it means. Again, if you're not asking, if you're asking different questions, you're going to get different answers. Jason, the workshop I attended that you generously facilitated at the UnConference was on narrative dialogue. Can you yeah. explain more about the work you're doing there? Sure. So um, the work with narrative dialogue is a way for, for people to have conversations around topics. They can be difficult topics. They can be contentious, uh, critical topics. They can be topics that are pretty, um, pretty mundane. Um, but it's a way for us to have deeper thoughts about these things because they're even deeper thoughts in the mundane. Um, so it's a way for us to be able to center ourselves around an object, um, usually typically a piece of, um, piece of poetry short fiction, something very quick, something that can be read um, by a group of people, usually around um, under 20, um, and a piece of art or an image. Um, and then you begin by introducing a theme or a couple themes, and then ask people to, to think about those themes in light of the poem and the image. And then to have an open discussion, and there are no right or wrong answers, and there are ground rules, and um, people seem to respect them, and it's really amazing watching it. And I see it as a building, as a stairway. Um, there's, um, it just seems like a stairway. People, we just build, the conversation just builds. And the hardest thing as a facilitator is to trust the group. Um, and you just trust the group, you don't have to worry about it. Because I've done a ton of research on what it is that's presenting. I, I picked what I presented, what I'm going to present. Um, but if it's successful, I will talk very little. And the group will talk very much. And um, my, if I do talk, it'll just be directing us to, to let's consider something deeper. And, um, and that's really a powerful, I think, is a mode um, as a facilitator to realize that you have, you're running this thing, but you're not even in it, in a sense, if you do it right. You're, you're of it, but you're not in it. Um, but it's really interesting to watch people have these deeper conversations. And you look at these images, you look at this poem, and you look at it very... Uh, simply very descriptively in the beginning, and then you interpret it, um, which poetry again and images are, are very useful for, and then what are the implications in the real world? What are the implications in our, in our lives? So for instance, I, I used a poem called Fire in our, ses in our session, and what I wanted people to think about is, of course, the spaces in between that fire, but that's not for me to bring out in the conversation. That's for the participants, which of course you did, and the discussion then centered around that, because that I found was the most interesting, but that doesn't mean the group will. So that conversation can go different ways, and I'm okay with it going different ways, as long as we think about it deeper, 
and then think about the implications for our lives and for our work and, and what we do. And so and one of the really fascinating things I found from this is that I, I hear the word therapy. It feels like group therapy over and over again. And so uh, I'm looking to expand what we do with the uh, negotiating narratives. I'm, uh, I, when I'm talking to someone now, I'd like to do it with veterans. Um, I also would like to do it with uh, police officers and, and people of color in urban areas um, to talk about uh, issues, but to not really necessarily directly talk about them in ways that are intimidating or ways that are coercive, um, but we talk about them in ways that are respectful and ways that are reflecting that the power of negotiating narratives is not just the moment that we have in, the, in that space together, but it's also in walking away. One of the things I, I always thought about uh, museums when I was a museum professional, and I think about this now, um, working in philanthropy, is that once you walk away from it, if you don't take something away from it, you've been unsuccessful. So no matter what it is in life, um, whether it's a museum exhibit, whether it's a, a session um, at a conference, um, whether it's a class, whether it's a person, um, the ones that are the most impactful are the ones you walk away thinking about and come to mind later. And so um, that's something I find with negotiating narratives that's really powerful, that people come back to this. And so you hope that this, this group knowledge, right, this um, group think, um, though it's not group think because it's not all of us thinking in the same direction, it's us thinking as a group, as a living organism, that that, um, that process and that the insights that are gained from there um, that those things will impact us and we'll think about those things going forward in our lives outside of those sections. I've continued to think about it and right. I've had conversations about it um, and I will continue to think about this conversation as well and I, I thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, not really. I think that's about it. Um, I hope that uh, you keep on listening stories and people keep telling stories but um, and more importantly, I hope that we continue as human beings to, to tell stories to each other and to want to hear each other's stories and to accept them for what they are. Um, to not say that's not but to say I didn't know that and to say I'd like to understand that more um, and, and to not be judgmental. Um, one of the things I think that the most important thing I think for any uh, storyteller and a person that consumes stories is to not judge.